Hello there. My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. August the 1st, 2011 marked the 150th anniversary of the British weather forecast, which first appeared in the Times back in 1861. It was prepared by Vice Admiral Robert Fitzroy, former captain of HMS Beagle, when Charles Darwin was on board collecting the evidence he would later come to rely on for his groundbreaking theory of evolution. Fitzroy's instructions were given to him by his immediate superior, the Admiralty, Francis Beaufort, who himself made a major contribution to the understanding of boating weather by devising the Beaufort wind scale, which was based on visual observation and is still used to this day to describe wind strength in terms such as fresh force 5, gale force 8 and storm force 10. The inspiration behind that first published daily weather forecast was a loss of a ship known as the Royal Charter, with over 500 lives, off Anglesey in a fierce storm in 1859. But the embryonic Met Office had actually been envisaged some five years earlier in 1854, as an experimental government department set up under the Board of Trade, whose aim was to research the possibilities of forecasting the weather to protect British naval ships and the crews. Fitzroy was the first to observe weather patterns on link-up points of equal pressure like map contours with lines known as isobars, producing synoptic charts which again, like the Beaufort scale, are still in use today. This greatly impressed fishermen and sailors out on the sea risking life and limb, but not so commercial vessel owners who saw their profits continually reduced by time not spent at sea. As a result, Pressure from people with influence to abandon the idea eventually won the day, and the project was abandoned, sadly resulting in Fitzroy taking his own life. But after yet more boating tragedies, within 13 years, daily weather forecasting was reinstated, paving the way for the National Met Office which we as sea anglers come to rely on so much today. The current Met Office HQ is based at Exeter, on the aptly named Fitzroy Road, and when, on the 4th of February 2002, Shipping forecast sea area Finisterre was renamed by the Met Office to avoid confusion with the Spanish forecast area of the same name. The new name chosen for it was Fitzroy, in honour of the founder. We Brits are said to be obsessed with the weather, and none more so than sailors. In particular, boat anglers who for a variety of reasons including personal safety and port restrictions have their activities strictly controlled by it. It goes without saying then that some understanding of what weather is and how its systems not only can be predicted, but also clearly understood, is of vital importance, making forecasting as relevant today as it was on August 1st, 1861. So there's a certain irony here in that the person about to explain this great British institution to us happens to be an American meteorology expert, Dr. David Schultz, based at Manchester University. Now with so much of our weather coming from systems brewing up over on the US side of the Atlantic Ocean, the obvious first question has to be, what exactly is Atlantic weather, what are its causes, and how are these influenced? The primary phenomenon that we need to think about when we consider the weather across the Atlantic and then coming on shore here into the UK is the position and the intensity of the jet stream or the storm track. And if you look globally, there tends to be two major storm tracks where tracks of low pressure systems and high pressure systems move from west to east generally. One is over the North Atlantic, one's over the North Pacific. And then in the southern hemisphere, there are, of course, there are storm tracks there as well. But what causes these storm tracks? Well, it's a region where the cold air from the north and the warm air in the equatorial regions have come together into a much stronger gradient than they are, say, at other parts of the planet. So here we have an enhanced difference in temperature uh, over a short distance, not only near the surface, but, say, up through 5 to 10 kilometers above the surface, region of cold air to the north and warm air to the south here in the northern hemisphere. So in this region where the temperature gradient is much tighter, turns out through some of the laws of physics that have been developed for the atmosphere that um, the wind speed also tends to be stronger here as well. And where this wind speed is stronger, we tend to find regions where storms are are more active. This region where the winds are are relatively stronger, of course, is called the jet stream. And uh, the storm tracks 
follow the jet stream in this location. I've noticed that sometimes the jet stream will migrate further south than its normal route, which can also cause problems in placing things on tracks they wouldn't perhaps normally take. Right, and the jet stream is not just some kind of fixed tube of air that has a constant position either in, you know, over the course of the year or even from day to day. The jet stream has meanders in it. You can think of it as a faster moving channel of air above the surface of the earth, and this channel has meanders in it. Sometimes the jet stream is further south, sometimes it's further north. And because the jet stream is this region where the temperature gradient is stronger than normal, south of the jet stream, you'll have warmer than normal conditions. So if the jet stream moves to the north of the UK, then we tend to be in situations where we have above normal temperatures. If the jet stream takes a dip to the south of the UK, then we tend to be colder than normal. And so these meanders in the jet stream, what meteorologists will call troughs, these are dips where the jet stream is further south than normal, or ridges where the jet stream is further north than normal. These troughs and ridges then determine what kind of temperature we have and also the, the type of weather we have. What causes these meanders? This is just the nature of the jet stream, that when you have these strong winds, this tight temperature gradient, it produces um, an instability, and this produces the weather, and that's what makes life on Earth interesting. As I understand it, the equator forms a sort of weather barrier, in that warmer moving away from it towards subtropical and temperate latitudes is what ultimately triggers the rotations which form high and low pressure systems, which the jet stream then feeds across. Well, there's two things here. One, around low pressure systems where the surface pressure tends to be lower, the winds in the northern hemisphere tend to rotate anti-clockwise, counterclockwise, around these lows near the surface of the Earth. Around high pressure systems, the winds tend to blow clockwise in the northern hemisphere. This, of course, is reversed in the southern hemisphere, and the reason for this is what we call the Coriolis force. In the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis force causes these low pressure systems to move in a, in a counterclockwise way. The winds around the lows move in this counterclockwise way. But in the southern hemisphere, a low pressure system would actually be moving in the opposite sense. And this is just due to the rotation of the Earth. And quite simply, if you want to understand what causes weather on the very largest scales, why the jet streams exist, why winds around low pressure systems move in a counterclockwise way in the northern hemisphere, but clockwise way in the southern hemisphere, it's simply the interaction between two things. One is the location of the pressure and the isobars, how they are oriented. And then the second thing is the Coriolis force. So it depends on what hemisphere you're in. And does either land or water temperature also have a part to play in determining weather systems? Certainly it does, and that's why the storm tracks in the northern hemisphere tend to be over the water is because the land plays two roles. One, um, the mountains, if you consider the Rocky Mountains, disrupt the flow and cause flow to be extra ridgy, divert to the north and then, then to the south over the Rocky Mountains. And then and so downstream of that in the eastern United States and then over the North Atlantic, that's when the storm track starts. So, yeah, I mean, the land is, and, and especially the mountains, are affecting the position and the intensity of the jet stream, and then that results in the storm tracks. So Atlantic laws, which are the bane of sea angling here in the UK, start building your side of the pond and track across towards possibly deepening as they go. What is it, then, that triggers that embryonic law? The way it starts is you can imagine um, a relatively straight jet stream, that's, of course, in the upper part of the atmosphere, above the surface of the Earth. But at the surface of the Earth, you'd have a relatively benign pressure pattern, neither high nor low. What happens is these little perturbations get going in the jet stream, and these meanders start to amplify. So you'll get a greater excursion to the north and south. And so wherever you start developing a trough, uh, remember a southward dip, in the northern hemisphere, in the jet stream, then you would start to develop a low pressure system 
at the surface. And these low pressure systems then would be associated with a circulation, as we talked about before, where the winds are counterclockwise. Remember also that I said that the jet stream was associated with a temperature gradient. So as this circulation starts to spin up, this developing low pressure system, you also have a temperature gradient. And so you start moving warm air from the equatorial regions up northward in, in the case of the Northern Hemisphere. So that's on the east side of this circulation. And so you start moving warm air to the north, and this forms what we call a warm front. Now, to the rear of the cyclone, back towards the west, where you have cold air coming from the north towards the south, you now have what we call a cold front. This is cold air advancing and replacing the warm air. So you, in the very earliest stages of a low pressure system developing, you have this warm air moving to the north, to the east of the low, and to the west of the low, cold air moving south. And so you have a developing warm front to the east and a developing cold front to the west of this developing low pressure system. And again, in layman's terms, can you explain the significant points of and differences between high and low pressure systems? Plus, of course, there are isobars. We've, we've mentioned the term isobars before, and isobars are, um, if you're looking at, say, a surface pressure map that you might see on the Met Office webpage, then these isobars are lines of constant pressure. So what we do is we take measurements of pressure around the world and imagine that the pressure at the surface is sea level. And so wherever you are, across the globe, we produce these maps of sea level pressure, and wherever the pressure is high and wherever the pressure is low, we draw these lines, these contours then that we call isobars that connect regions on the map of constant pressure. Now, these isobars are quite important. Uh, at a basic level, a kind of first order approximate level, the winds will blow parallel to the isobars with low pressure on the left. Now, where you have strong accelerations in the flow, where you are over land, there will be some deviation in this orientation, and so the winds may not be perfectly parallel to the isobars. But the basic rule, especially out over the water, where you don't have a lot of friction between the air and the lower surface of the Earth, the basic rule is wind blows parallel to the isobars with lower pressure on its left if you're facing downwind. So that's kind of the basic idea of why, why isobars are important. Not only do they tell us where the low pressure systems are and where the high pressure systems are, but it tells us a first good approximation of what the wind directions are. Now, as we mentioned before, you have in locations where you have low pressure systems developing, you have fronts. And associated with these fronts, there tends to be air that's moving up in the atmosphere away from the surface. And as this air rises, it cools and it may condense to produce clouds and then eventually produce precipitation. So where these fronts are, where these low pressure systems are, tend to be associated with rising air motion in the atmosphere, and this rising air motion is what produces essentially clouds and precipitation in, in many circumstances. So the other reason that we care about these surface pressure maps is that they tell us where the low pressure systems are, and that tends to be associated with the rising motion, and that tends to be associated with clouds and precipitation. So if, if you have a barometer at home, oftentimes you'll see that as the pressure falls, the basic rule of thumb is that the weather will be getting, you know, more adverse, and that's because of this relatively simple rule that where low pressure is, the air tends to be rising, producing clouds and precipitation. On the other hand, if you're looking at high pressure systems, this is where air tends to be descending, and if the air is descending, then it tends to dry out and therefore does not produce clouds and precipitation. So you may see some light fluffy clouds, cumulus clouds, present during high pressure systems, but certainly in terms of very strong updrafts that would produce heavy rain and so on, you tend not to see this 
in many situations where there's high pressure. So once again, coming back to this theme where pressure is on the increase, that would mean that a high pressure system is approaching and you would tend to be having generally improved weather, so more favorable fair weather. Picking the bones out of that and summarizing it from a vault angling perspective, Low pressure systems are rising air, often resulting in cloud cover and rain with more tightly packed isobars spaced at 4 millibar intervals, rotating anti-clockwise, and are, therefore, windy, whereas high pressures have their air descending, therefore making it drier and warmer, with wider spaced isobars and a clockwise rotation, which because of the isobar width should produce less in the way of wind. The big message being, tighter isobars equals more wind and knowing the direction of rotation means we can therefore ascertain its direction of flow too from the Atlantic chart as shown on the TV weather forecast. Isobars also connect points of equal pressure in just the same way as Admiralty Sea chart contours connect areas of similar depth. That's right, the bathymetric profiles, the contours on there indicate lines of constant depth and so if you can imagine following these contours then would be exactly like that. As a general rule High pressure and offshore boat fishing go hand in glove, so when we as anglers see a high pressure building on the chart, we quite naturally start getting the gear and all the bait ready. But then, sometimes when we get there, contrary to the rules, we find the wind blowing really quite hard. So how then does that work? Right, even though the high pressure system would indicate generally improving weather, that doesn't say necessarily anything about the winds, because the winds are going to be determined by the packing of these isobars. And say you have a high pressure system moving in, but if there's a low pressure system downstream that refuses to get out of the way, then as these two systems approach, the isobars will pack together in a very simple way of thinking, and the winds could be stronger even though the pressure is increasing. So although there's some kind of general way of thinking about highs as being improving weather, that doesn't necessarily say much about the winds. That's all going to depend on these isobaric gradients. And so if you're looking at surface pressure charts from the Met Office, say, then if you're looking for relatively calm winds on the large scale, look for regions where the pressure gradient is relatively slack, where the isobars are spread apart. So it gets blocked and the isobars become compressed causing the wind. Now let's consider a deepening area of low pressure forming off the eastern US coast and headed our way. What then is the likely timing of its arrival and are the factors which could perhaps deepen it along the way, potentially making it ever windier the closer it gets to the UK? Oh sure, these storms once they get going can deepen and, and if you remember the October 1987 storm, this storm deepened just a few hundred kilometers offshore of the UK. I mean, that's when it underwent its most rapidly deepening. So what may seem like a relatively innocuous little storm just offshore of the UK could deepen relatively quickly in certain circumstances. But going back to your question, yeah, it generally takes a, a day or two for these storms to move across the Atlantic, you know, and it's all going to depend on the nature of the jet stream how fast the winds are and if there's any you know these meanders in the jet stream over the Atlantic that, that may slow the movement down of these storms. Obviously then the track of a low pressure system and for that matter the position of a windy high pressure system which can also happen from time to time will have a major bearing on boating activity. A low to the south of the country when it first hits can bring easterly winds which for the Lancashire coast for example means an inshore sea flattening offshore blow whereas the same law with its centre to the north will first bring in westerly winds. So position as well as rotation and isobar tightness is crucial to both the initial and the final outcome. Yeah, I mean I think it comes down to this idea that the wind is going to blow parallel to the isobars with lower pressure on the left and so if you know the pressure pattern, if you're looking at a current forecast map for 12 hours in the future or so, then where the position of the low is, like you said, will determine the winds. And, and so, once again, looking at this broad pressure pattern, if the low is to the south of the UK, then the isobars would be oriented east to west across the UK. And with the lower pressure to the south of us, that would bring air from the east across the UK 
moving towards the west. So, so there we would have onshore flow from the North Sea and then offshore flow to the Irish Sea. With the reverse being true, if the centre of the high tracks across the very far north of Scotland. Initially then, we would have southerlies giving way to westerlies, then northwesterlies, and finally northerlies. That's right. So having a, a low that tracks north of Scotland then would tend to bring onshore flow to Wales and, and so on, and then offshore flow to the east of England. And you also get a bit of a quieter spot in the centre of a low pressure, which can bring a short-lived decrease in wind and rapid change of direction, which could persuade somebody on the spot to maybe grab a few hours of flow, which to me at least is a risk not worth taking. Well, I'm not sure that the centre of a low is the place to go looking for a quiet spot of the wind. So, I mean, I, I, I probably would avoid that, partially because the weather is generally going to be worse there. You're going to be probably under precipitation. The winds will tend to be a little bit stronger there, and if the storm is moving quickly, then whatever lull in the winds you're looking for is going to be relatively short-lived. But certainly, in the center of a high, you know, if the high takes the fortuitous route across your location, then, yeah, I mean, the, the, you could have relatively calm winds for 12 hours or, or more. If the high sits over the UK, you know, or we're in a relatively um, slow moving pattern, such as during the middle of the summer, then we could have nice weather for several days on end. With modern communications and satellite tracking, it's quite easy to pick up and follow the bigger picture with weather systems, though arguably less easy to predict what it is they're going to do next. From a small boat angling point of view, one of the biggest frustrations is that after going online or talking to the Coast Guard and checking out the inshore waters forecast, and maybe abandoning a trip on the basis of that information, as the day progresses, both weather and sea conditions turn out to be a far cry from the predictions. How can that be? I mean, let's consider how a weather forecast is made, and I think that if, after knowing how a weather forecast is made, perhaps you have a better appreciation for why sometimes they go wrong. Imagine if you had a cricket ball and a cricket bat, and the bowler throws the ball at you, and, and I wanted to predict you know, where this ball would go after you hit it. Well, what would I need to make that kind of prediction? Well, I would need to know the speed at which the bowler throws the ball. I'd need to know the direction it's moving. And then from the batter's perspective, I would have to understand where he's hitting it on the bat, the direction that the bat is moving, its orientation relative to the ball, if there's spin being applied to the ball. All these things will affect, then, where the ball goes. And even the best batters, they're trying to maximize, you know, where they want to place the ball, but it's not perfect, right? I mean, sometimes they swing and a miss. Sometimes the ball goes cockeyed off the bat. Weather forecasting is a little bit of the same thing. If you take that analogy with cricket and then say that weather forecasting is, is a physically based science, just like trying to predict where this ball is, then you have two problems. First is that you have to know exactly what the weather conditions are now in order to understand what they're going to be in the future. And the problem is that we don't understand what the weather is precisely at everywhere on the globe that we would like it. Consider the very simple fact that upstream of the UK is a whole ocean and we don't have a lot of information about what's going on over the ocean. I mean, we have satellites, we have commercial aircraft that are collecting data, but those are only going to be in the flight lanes. Those are only going to be at the level of the jet, 10 kilometers above the ground. So we don't have a lot of information about what's going on over the surface. We have a few ships that report, some buoys, but not a lot of information. So we have an incomplete understanding of the present weather. And if we don't understand the present weather, then we can't make a very good prediction. So that's one reason why forecasts sometimes go wrong, is that we don't understand the present weather. The second reason why weather forecasts may go wrong is simply that we don't have a good model that represents the atmosphere, the way it works, and that computer model is what we use to predict the weather at, at some basic level. Take, for instance, the fact that we have limited computer power. Even the most uh, sophisticated weather forecasting models now have a grid spacing, have calculate the weather 
every one and a half kilometers away from each other. So, so there's a grid one and a half kilometers square over the entire UK, and uh, the weather is being predicted by the computer on that scale. But as you know, the weather can sometimes vary from one block to the next in the city or just offshore. The winds could be substantially different. The temperatures could be substantially different on scales smaller than this one and a half kilometer grid box. So our ability to model the atmosphere depends on how well we understand it, how well our computer models are, and the grid spacing that exists. And so this is the second thing that limits our ability. And so sometimes when weather forecasts go bad, it's because, you know, it's trying to model some process that we don't fully understand. And we as scientists are trying to work to improve our understanding of the atmosphere so that we can improve the models. And then the third thing that of why weather forecasts may go wrong is a thing called chaos or the butterfly effect. You may have heard of that. Chaos basically says that even if we had perfect models and the perfect initial conditions, just because we cannot measure everything as precisely as we want, we can't have a grid of observations at every point in the atmosphere. We can't measure everything to the degree of precision necessary. Ultimately, we're limited in our ability to predict the future. And there's a very famous person named Edward Lorenz from the United States in the 60s who discovered that the atmosphere was a chaotic system in that it didn't reproduce the exact weather in the future at any time in the past. And so the weather was always going to be different and that ultimately we were limited in our ability to predict it. Theoretically, Edward Lorenz said that we are limited to two weeks in predictability. I think what we know is depending on what we're trying to forecast, you know, our predictability to the large scale weather patterns, you know, the movement of the highs and lows are probably limited to a few days. But if you really wanted very specific wind forecasts along the coastal region, those are, are probably limited. You know, our ability to predict them is probably much shorter, you know, on this, on this base of hours, say, because of, of the small scale processes that we just simply can't resolve. So I think given those three things, I mean, one of the points that I always make to my students is we are lucky that we do weather forecasting at all, given the fact that we have imperfect observations of the atmosphere, given the fact that we do the best job we can with the available computer resources and our understanding to produce the best computer models that exist. But ultimately, we're limited by chaos, our ability to you know, simply produce reliable forecasts. And so for all these three reasons, I say that, we're, that we should be thankful that we get anything out of the weather forecasts that are useful. And, and yeah, you have to take it with a grain of salt and recognize what the, the useful information that you can get from weather forecasts are. The large scale weather patterns tend to be predicted relatively well, but very localized weather patterns, you know, just the existence of little showers can pop up seemingly without being predicted, well, the reality is that it'll be a very long time, if at all, until we're able to predict those kind of um, showers popping up. But that doesn't mean that we can't tell you, as meteorologists, the probability of precipitation. You know, we could tell you, okay, there's going to be a higher probability of precipitation, say a 70% chance of, of showers today, but, you know, maybe tomorrow it could be only a 20% chance of showers. And so you would anticipate there would be less likely chance that, that you might get hit by a shower. So I think given this broader perspective, there's information that you can get from the weather forecast that will be useful. But when you're out on the boat, you know, or looking for a relatively short-term forecast, yeah, you do have to take some responsibility for yourself, recognizing that simply the science is not there. One point I would like to make here is that while rain and snow is uncomfortable while you're outside and sunshine is very nice, from a boat angling perspective, only wind counts as weather. And following on from what you've just discussed, I believe that land topography, urbanisation and even crop cover can also have very localised effects on coastal conditions too. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying, that, that you know these very small-scale details, cloud cover, the shape of the coastline little localized pools of cold air, cold water, will affect 
the weather that you experience. And computer models just simply cannot handle that kind of detail. We don't observe it, and the models don't have enough computer power to handle it. So you're right. Those are things where you know you have to take some responsibility for yourself if you're going to go out and, and recognize that there will be variability when you're out on the water. All of that said, how would you then sum up weather forecast accuracy statistics? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on uh, what kind of uh, information you want. Weather forecasts on the large scale are, are always improving. I've seen some statistics that say the four-day forecast now is as good as the one-day forecast was in 1977. So, I mean, that kind of gives you a sense of the, of the rate of improvement that we're making. The two-day forecast now is as good as the one-day forecast was 13 years ago. So we are making improvements, but in terms of how accurate are they? I mean, it all depends on what parameter you want to forecast. Do you want to forecast the temperature? Do you want to forecast the occurrence of rain? depends on whether you want a one-day forecast, a two-day forecast. It depends on who's making the forecast. It depends on how you verify it with the statistics. <laughs> so you put me on the spot, and I'll throw it back to you and say, well, if you give me very specific yeah. information, then perhaps that information is out there. But I would say that we are getting better. Certainly making forecasts of the temperature, especially high temperatures, are a lot easier to make than forecasts of the low temperatures. But even beyond that, forecasting temperatures is a lot easier than forecasting the precipitation, just the occurrence of the precipitation. Then if you want to know, well, how much rain is going to fall, well, that's even a more complicated thing. So, you know, as you go into smaller and smaller scales, it becomes more difficult. But if it makes things easier for you, as I've already said, forget all that tricky stuff such as rainfall, because the only thing that matters to us is wind. Right. So so forecasting wind, once again, will depend on, on the kind of scale. If you want kind of the broad scale wind direction, then we probably do pretty well with that. But if you're talking about, okay, give me the specific wind direction within the you know Bristol Channel or you know within the Thames Estuary or something, you know, then it's it's gonna be more difficult to predict because of the small scale localized conditions and, and um you know then once you include cloud cover and precipitation or, or sunshine. Once again, that's going to complicate the wind on the very small scale itself. But on the large scale, you know, the wind's going to be out of the west in the general, or are they going to be out of the east? We should be pretty good with that, you know, out to several days. But on the small scale, that will be very difficult to predict. Something else we offshore boaters also need to understand is the Beaufort scale, simply because coastal forecasters so often include it. As was said earlier, it was devised back in the 1850s, so it even predates the Met Office itself. But how useful or relevant is it now? The Beaufort scale, yeah. Where, where the Beaufort number is, is larger, it goes up to 10 or 12 or something like that, where the Beaufort scale is larger, then the wind speed is stronger. And that um, the Beaufort scale was a, a scale that was developed simply for, for mariners because they, they didn't have a lot of observations. Uh, they didn't have very precise instruments out on the ship, but they could determine, you know, how's it affecting the flags on the ship, what it's the shape of uh, the waves looking like, you know, I mean, do you see a lot of white caps? And so they use these observations in a very practical sense to develop the Beaufort scale. And of course, now with modern instrumentation, we can take these observations and then apply how many miles per hour is this wind when we start to see white caps. Another wind-related topic affecting small boats, particularly during the summer months, is sea breezes. It may well be that we're fishing miles offshore in flat, calm, oily conditions. Then, as we get closer to the shore at the end of the day, it starts to cut up rough. Yeah, sea breeze is, um, just like you said, on a very nice, calm, apparently calm summer day, um, the land will heat up much more quickly than the ocean, and you've seen this happen you know, from your own experience. The water will absorb a lot of energy from the sun before it warms up, but the land will warm up and cool down a lot more easily. And so what a sea breeze is, then, is the response of the atmosphere, the wind, to these variations in temperature. So as the land heats up, the pressure becomes lower over the land, and then this starts turning the wind towards the land. And so as 
the wind from the sea starts blowing towards the land, then you get an onshore flow, and we call that the sea breeze because the wind is blowing from the sea to the land. At night, the reverse happens. Land cools down, becomes colder, higher pressure over the land, and so then the wind tends to blow a little bit more offshore. Now, um, the land breeze tends to be a little weaker than the sea breeze. You can get five, ten knots easily out of, a, out of a good sea breeze on a nice warm summer day, and especially if the water over the um, sea is cold. So in the spring, sea breezes can be quite enhanced relative to other times of the year. And what might be the sea with the extent of a brisk sea breeze? That's kind of hard to say, and this is one of the difficulties, you know, on this kind of small-scale forecasting, but and it, it depends on, on kind of the larger scale wind patterns, too. If the wind is generally on the larger scale coming onshore, then the effect of the sea breeze coming onshore could be 10, 50 kilometers inland. So you can have those, those gusty winds that much more. But if you've got offshore flow, and you try to develop this sea breeze, then it could be, you know, 10, 20 kilometers offshore that you start to experience the gusty winds, but then as you approach the shore, then it tends to be, you know, you're in that warmer air, tends to be a little less gusty. Another factor we also need to bear in mind, along with wind direction, is the direction of the tide, which if the two are running together, will give flatter conditions, and later when the tide turns, putting the pair in opposition. Now, despite the fact that on the beach, the tide and the waves appear to come to shore at right angles to it, due to complications in local geography, offshore that very often isn't the case. Where I mainly fish along the Lancashire coast, the tide actually runs parallel to the shore. So as meteorology falls under the umbrella of earth sciences at the university, for those that may not already know, can you now give us a brief overview regarding the phenomenon of tides? The tides are a response to the gravitational attraction that the moon exerts on the earth. You know, of course, the atmosphere has its own tides, the sea has its tides, and of course, these are the ones that are most important for mariners. But the moon even exhibits tidal forces on the earth, and um, we can experience those in terms of the stresses that the moon is applying to the solid earth. So from a practical point of view for mariners, then, the tides are this response of the sea to the moon's attraction. And so there will be, turns out, two bulges of water being attracted to the moon, one directly towards the moon, and then one 180 degrees on the other side of the earth. Um, so on the, on the largest scale, that's what you would experience. You would experience two high tides over the course of the day if we had a very smooth a distribution of continents around the, the earth. But of course we don't. We have inlets, we have complications, the bathymetry of the sea will slow down or accelerate these tides. And so rather than having tides, say, approximately every 12 hours, what we experience then are tides um, that vary by location. And so where the ocean water, as it's coming in to channels, has to work its way around interesting regions of bathymetry, then the tides may be delayed relative to other locations that are more exposed to the free ocean. Why is it then that during the period of spring tides, off Blackpool for example, it can top out at maybe 10.3 metres, yet over on the east coast it might have half that rise and fall, yet in real terms actually be running harder? Well, once again, because of the bathymetry and, and how the water, you know, as this water is being sloshed around in the ocean basins, it's got to work its way around, and it'll be deflected by the terrain. You know, some places it'll be concentrated. You know, and then, of course, this all depends as well on the local meteorology. There will be an additional effect due to the direction of the winds, as you mentioned, that will pile up water in certain locations where the highs are, where the lows are. These will also affect the height of the tides, and so, so yeah, the tide guides are basically the astronomical forces that come into play in, in um, moving water around on the Earth. You know, then you have to account for, you know, what the weather effect is doing, too, and if you have a strong storm with a large fetch, then you could have a substantial difference between what the astronomical tides and your tide tables are saying 
versus what the reality is. So just like weather forecasting is a little bit uncertain for some things, the uncertainty with the tide tables are exactly do the same things, the things that aren't easy to predict, the weather and how they affect the distribution of the water in the ocean basins will affect the tides. And you mentioned having two tides a day, which though true, is not entirely true. That's right. It's a little more than, than 12 hours yeah. return cycle. That's right. Yeah. And as if that was not enough, causing the times of the tides to stagger by an extra 40 minutes and sometimes more each day, we also have neap tides which occur when the strong gravitational pull of the moon is partly cancelled out by that of the sun which is very much further away when the two are at right angles to each other, and spring tides which can be the real biggies when the sun and moon are pulling in the same direction. So can we now have a look what's going on there? Well, I think you just said it, right? I mean, the sun is also affecting um, the distribution of the water in, in these ocean basins. And so where the sun and the moon are pulling together, the tides will be slightly higher than when, when they're pulling in opposite directions. So despite the fact that the sun is many times bigger than anything else in our solar system, it's the moon that's the main player in all of this. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the moon is much more localized and it's, and it's rotating around us in this roughly 24-hour cycle, but the sun isn't changing its distribution. I mean, it, it's still that same gravitational attraction all the, all the time. So the, it, we, our, our rotation rate around the sun takes a year, whereas the moon has this very rapid rotation around us. That's why the, the tides are, are much more strongly related to the moon. But of course, yeah, I mean, the gravitational attraction that we feel to the sun is quite strong, or we wouldn't be moving around the sun. I seem to recall reading that at the end of the dinosaurs' reign 65 million years ago, there would have been around 385 days in a year. And back when the moon was first created out of the impact between the Earth and the planet Thea, not only were the days even shorter still, but the tides back then were inconceivably large. And obviously over time, both day number and tide size have decreased and will continue to decrease as the moon slips ever further away. On geologic timescales, that's certainly true. You know, hundreds of millions of years ago, Earth's day was only, say, 20 hours rather than 24 hours. And so a year then would contain 400-some days. Over geologic time, the Earth is slowing down, and the effects that we feel in terms of the rotation are slowing down. Can we now move on to discuss a couple of localized effects of weather with particular relevance to boat fishermen, the first of these being fog, and in particular, freezing fog? There's several things that, that cause fog. One of the obvious ones would be if you have relatively warm air that's nearly saturated, very high humidity warm air that that's, gets blown out over relatively cold water. And so you might see this early in the spring where, where the land gets heated up. You've got long southerly fetch out over the land. It picks up a lot of moisture, say, and then, and then boom, it goes out over this cold water. And so that will cause it to condense that moisture, produce the fog. So, it, yeah, it could be very localized effects where you see this fog. So, how to predict it? <laughs> I think listen to the broad marine forecasts, and they'll tell you if that kind of fog is prevalent. You know, another type of fog would be in a situation where it's raining into relatively cold air near the surface, and that cold air will condense as the rain falls through this cold air, condenses into, into fog, uh, evaporates, condenses into fog. So in association with the rain, sometimes you can get this kind of fog. What about freezing fog? Freezing fog is, is simply a fog where the temperature is below zero. Now you may think that, you know, why isn't this fog then full of ice crystals rather than liquid water droplets? Well, in the atmosphere, we can have liquid water droplets at temperatures below freezing. And sometimes it can go, these, these liquid water drops can be, say, minus 8, minus 10, minus 15 degrees C before they actually form ice crystals. And so in this, what we call supercooled liquid water droplets, these clouds, these cloud droplets may attach to your boat. And then because the boat is below freezing, then they'll freeze onto the boat. And so, yeah, sure, that can cause numerous headaches, if not be particularly dangerous if you're in a freezing fog. So, yeah, particularly when you're going out and the temperatures start to drop below freezing, even sea spray will freeze on your boat. So, so those are particular situations you need to be careful in. Another one is the way that land and air temperatures can lag each other, 
depending of course on the time of the year. One particularly fishy example of this would be the way that anglers associate whiting coming in up to the beaches when we get the first frosts. The fact that whiting are an autumn fish and that frost is normally present during high pressure, which in turn means settled in shore conditions carrying no suspended sediment, all of which whiting prefer, doesn't seem to register much with many of these people. The truth is that just because it suddenly drops cold on the beach or out in the boat, it could be weeks before its effects are felt in the sea. Let's start with this kind of weather lore. As you just demonstrated, you know, there's some good science that sometimes underlies these kind of weather lures, you know, red sky at night, sailor's delight kind of stuff. And so, you know, the whiting following the frost is exactly like this. Sometimes these weather lures are based in legitimate science and um, can be useful in some kind of broad scale weather forecasting. But, you know, sometimes they are just weather lures and not necessarily tied to anything in particular, you know, just something that's been passed down in the generations and continues to get passed down, but doesn't have any real justification in, in terms of the science. So, yeah, I mean, it, it would be interesting to know exactly, you know, some more of these kind of weather lures and test them out. As a quick rule of thumb, what timescales we're looking at in terms of seasonal lag, though presumably air temperatures and water depth will ultimately play some part too. Um, look at it from this perspective, right? We say the first day of summer is late June, you know, 21st, 22nd or so. Well, when do we experience the warmest temperatures in the summer? You know, we usually think of July, August, you know, maybe even early September as perhaps some of the warmer temperatures. Well, there's a two-month lag there, you know, between when the northern hemisphere is receiving the most solar energy and when our maximum temperatures are. You know, and that's just for the, for the land areas, you know, for the water, which has a much larger thermal inertia. It takes a lot more energy to heat up water as it does land, as we talked about with the land and sea breezes before. Then the delay will be even slightly larger. And the amount that you can raise the temperature of, of the water body will, will be less, substantially less. We know that the, that the oceans don't warm up and cool down to the same extent that the that the land does, you know, from a seasonal perspective. So, and, and like you said, this will depend on the depth, and I just don't know enough about that, but certainly there'll be regional variability in that waters north of Scotland will, will have a different kind of seasonal cycle in terms of their temperatures and so on. And then there may be even local effects inside the estuaries, inside the channels, due to the local circulations in the in the seas. Tying together what you've told us about weather and tides, can we now take a quick look at waves coming in onto a beach? Shore anglers tend to love them, as they turn out concealed food items within casting range. Beach launching boaters like myself see them as more of an obstacle for getting off for our fish. In truth, it doesn't matter which way the wind or the tide is moving the water, because waves, as I understand it, always like to come in parallel to a beach. Why is this? What forms waves? And why, when they get close in, do they break? You have to look much further offshore and, and say, okay, where's this energy coming from that's producing the waves? And, and so that's the wind out over the water, where the wind is traveling over the water for a long stretch. We call this the fetch. And where you have large fetch, then you are transferring a lot of energy from the wind to the water. And as this energy, this, this energized water, so to speak, has, is carrying these waves. As it comes closer to shore, the depth of the ocean is reducing, and then this causes this energy to be concentrated into a thinner and thinner layer, and then the waves start to break. All right, so on the largest scale, that's where these waves come from. It's the energy that the wind gave it well offshore. But how the shoreline is changing will affect these waves. If the shoreline has a rather steep incline towards the beach, then, you know, these waves will break quite rapidly. Whereas if it's a relatively shallow, gentle slope towards the beach, then the waves will break well offshore and not necessarily break near shore. So how the depth of the shoreline changes will affect the waves. And then the final thing that you did mention is that as waves approach the shoreline, they do get bent into a direction that's more parallel to the coastline. So there's that effect as well, that offshore the, the winds may be approaching the shoreline at some angle relative to the shoreline, but then 
as the waves approach the shore, the part that approaches the shore first slows down. The part offshore it moves faster, and then that's what causes the wave to reorient as it comes closer to the shore. And waves actually turning for the last 20 to 30 yards out from the beach is that a frictional effect slowing down the bottom of the wave and allowing the top to curl over. Well, it's a shallowing, shallowing effect, really. I mean, the, way, the water very nearest to the surface is moving faster than the water near the bottom, which, like you said, is frictionally reduced. So, yeah, the water near the surface of the air is moving faster than the water underneath the wave tips over. One final wave problem, which is particularly annoying at times, is that with a flat calm sea at high tide, you often get one or two big waves flopping onto the beach or worse still, the concrete slip, which can make getting in and out with a boat an absolute nightmare. It's just, you know, the, the nature of the, of, of the way the shoreline changes underneath. I mean, if the depth comes up very quickly, you know, what could be very deep waves, but just simply not have very much of a surface expression as the shoreline shallows very quickly as these waves come on shore, then all this energy is transferred into a very shallow layer of, of water, and that's when the waves come up and, and become very turbulent. Still with your Earth Sciences hat on, before we close, I'd like to throw a couple of indirect questions at you with very strong potential direct outcomes for sea anglers, particularly those with many years of fishing still ahead of them. The first of these is climate change and its potential to push some fish species out of range, while at the same time bringing in replacements. So global warming, is it perceived or is it real? Well, you asked if it's perceived, and I think I could turn that question back to you and say, as someone who's been out on the water for many years, you've probably seen that the weather, the climate has changed. Now, that doesn't mean that the climate hasn't changed from one season to another, but certainly many indications are that climate has changed, that it's, it's gotten warmer, that there are other local effects that, that have changed what we expect as the normal weather patterns here in the UK and other places around the world. So, yes, the, the climate is changing. Even in the absence of humans, of course, the, we would expect the climate to undergo these variations. But certainly we are running an experiment with our atmosphere by changing its chemical composition, by putting more carbon dioxide, more methane, more pollutants into that atmosphere. And all the best information that we have indicates that, yes, these things that we are doing to the atmosphere are changing our climate and are likely responsible for some of the types of changes that we've observed. That doesn't mean that you can identify any particular weather event and say this is due to climate change, but, you know, it certainly says on the average we would expect slightly different weather conditions over time. So yes, the climate is changing, and it's very likely that we are responsible for it. Now, given that, what do we do about it? That's very much a political question. The big question, I suppose, then, is whether it's entirely man-made, or, as has happened so many times in the Earth's history, other natural contributions are also being made, too. That's right. Certainly, there's no doubt that over geologic time, the climate has been different. The polar regions have been subtropical areas that the glaciers have expanded much further south in the northern hemisphere than they are now, the polar ice caps. So that's right. But I think what's going on is that the time scale over which these changes have happened have, have been thousands of years, if not millions of years, in the geologic history. But we are imposing man-made changes over a much shorter time, just in the hundred or so years that we've been dumping pollutants into the atmosphere at a very large rate. I mean, we're talking millions and billions of people demanding a lot of our atmosphere as a place to put our excess carbon dioxide that we've released from the geologic reservoir from burning fossil fuels. So, yes, on geologic timescales, this might, process might have happened naturally. It might have taken tens of hundreds, thousands of years, if not millions of years, but we're doing it over the span of a hundred years. And what that will mean for how species adapt, how rapid the ice sheet changes occur, whether species can adapt to these rapid changes, whether we as humans, what this means for how we've spent 
thousands of years developing our civilization in favorable locations to live. How will that change? These are important questions. And are there any other potentially worrying implications? Well, there's all these kind of other effects too. What happens when more ice melts? That will raise sea level, and, and you may have seen in the news some countries in the Pacific where thousands of people live just a few meters above sea level are looking at alternative locations to live because their island may be underwater within a generation or two. Focusing on Northern European and specifically UK waters now, what effect might this have on speciation and our species mix? Well, one thing that we, we need to consider, and, and you may have seen some recent studies on this, but even though we talk about climate change and global warming as if it's a global phenomenon, there will be local winners and local losers in terms of how the climate changes. And so here's one example of how you can't apply this simple, it'll just be warmer everywhere, thinking to what the future may look like. As we lose more sea ice in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's very clear, over, especially over the last 20 years, that there is less sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, and it's thinner, and it's um, not multi-year ice, we call it. It's just seasonal ice that gets replaced every winter. But as less and less ice is in the Northern Hemisphere in the, over the Arctic Ocean, you will then have more open water, and that water will be relatively warm, in the winter time relative to had it been covered in sea ice and, and the temperature could be a lot colder. All right, so now in the winter we have more open water, we have warmer surface conditions, and this will be a source for more moisture in the atmosphere. And being downwind of the Arctic, we could receive a lot of that moisture in the form of enhanced precipitation and perhaps even more snow. and colder weather patterns, and, and there have been several studies that have been published just recently indicating that, yeah, the UK and Western Europe could be in store for more colder winters and more precipitation because of the reduction in sea ice that will occur as a result of global climate change. Now, exact opposite could be happening in the summer, where, once again, with more sea ice, now you have more colder air masses possible over the water, and this again could bring more moisture towards us, more colder moisture air, and then this will keep us perhaps cooler, cloudier in the summertime. But these are still active areas of research, and we still have a lot to learn about what exactly will happen to the climate, but there's some indications that you just can't simply apply this, well, just because there's global warming means that everywhere is going to be warmer, everywhere is going to be drier, we're going to have this milder climate. It's not clear that it will necessarily work like that. So in terms then of, of how this affects the species, well, what does that mean? I mean, with, with more open water in the Arctic, how will this change then our distribution of, of heating? Will, be, will we be in an environment that receives more sun, and hence could be warmer, or will we be in, a, in an environment that's cloudier, and then hence maybe we receive less sunlight and, and the water is actually colder around Britain? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I know that, that it, it's, it's not as simple as it might seem at first glance. That said, there is a general perception that this, if it happens, will not be in our lifetime though anglers possibly more so than members of the public are seeing the early signs now with increasing numbers of new warm water species not only reaching our southern shores, but also progressing ever further north. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think, like I said, over our lifetime, people have experienced this, these changes in the weather. But like I said, this weather also affects different species and, and the budding times of plants. And, and so we have also evidence from these biological records to indicate that the climate has changed over time. And finally, while I do fully appreciate the potentially devastating effects of this to some coastal communities, isn't trying to mitigate its effect actually trying to deny the ongoing process of evolution which thrives on just this type of event? You could take that perspective, but I would turn it around a little bit and say, regardless of whether we have altered the climate or not, 
Is it not in society's best interest to protect ourselves from devastating weather events that we know will happen regardless of whether the climate's changing? I mean, the UK will continue to get strong winter storms. We will have areas that will get flash floods and river floods and so on. And regardless of whether this distribution of these events, the occurrence of these events changes in the future and whether we're responsible for it or not, is really an irrelevant question. We should better protect our society. And so there are things that we should be doing, regardless of where we live, to protect against this. And from where I lived in the United States, I came from an area where there were a lot of tornadoes. And it was just a smart thing, you know, to say, well, you should have underground storm shelters. You should have built your house to a higher level of building standard so that it had the ability to withstand relatively weak tornadoes. Of course, you can't protect against very violent tornadoes, but certainly there were relatively simple things that were inexpensive that you could do to protect yourself, your property, your house. And regardless of whether climate change was going to affect whether Oklahoma got more or less tornadoes, I just think it's a smart thing to do to protect our society against the threats that we experience from nature. Even if we freeze for any evolution to achieve it? Well, I mean, I would like to think that we're smarter than the average beast, and the people that protect themselves are the ones that will survive, right? To quote the great man himself, survival of the fittest. Exactly. So I would like to think that I can use my intelligence, you know, to make wiser choices in terms of how I want to I live my life. I mean, we buy insurance for our cars, we buy insurance for our health. These are things that we do to take personal responsibility for the threats that we face upon our lives. And taking this whole interview full circle now, personal responsibility is something we as both anglers should also be doing in seeking out, understanding and interpreting good weather forecasts. Yeah, ultimately right. I mean, you can get very broad, good public weather forecasts, but ultimately, you have to make a decision. When you start to see the winds kicking up, when you start to see darker clouds on the horizon, you have to take personal responsibility and go, okay, just because I heard on the radio that there wasn't going to be any severe weather, and then now something is popping up, visually, you have to identify that. And so I would recommend that if being a mariner, going out well offshore is an important thing for you and your hobby, and, you know, I, I love being outdoors just as much as anyone else, but ultimately, right, you have to protect yourself, and you should be smart when you go out there. So read up, continue to listen to uh, the website and the podcasts here to learn more about how to protect yourself, how to identify threatening weather, and take that into account when you're out and be aware of the environment that you're in. Yeah, good final message. And as a sea angler, these effects of weather, sea temperature, ocean currents and day length do very definitely, as we've heard, also have contributions to make outside of personal safety such as fish spawning success, seasonality lags, and degree of commercial exploitation. But for now at least, understanding the potential minefield that is weather forecasting will, hopefully, provide a better informed basis upon which to either call trips on or off. And for that, I'm extremely grateful to Dave Schultz for sharing his extensive knowledge on the subject of meteorology with us here today. 